We're here at the Barbican Centre at the exhibition Into the Unknown. It is very apt that I am with a person who actively encourages people to pursue careers in both arts and sciences. So who are you? So I'm Colin Stewart. I'm uh, an astronomy author and uh, also a speaker. Tell us a little bit about the things that you have authored, the books and the most recent articles. So it's very much popular science aimed at uh, non-scientists. So uh, the books I've written are kind of introductory guides to uh, physics, to maths, to astronomy. So it's the kind of thing that if you were interested but you didn't really know a lot about it, it's the place you would perhaps uh, start to, to learn about the universe. Can you tell us a little bit about your most recent book? Yeah, the most recent book uh, was 13 Journeys Through Space and Time, which was a look back at the uh, famous Christmas lectures that are given at the Royal Institution every year. Um, so it happened every year since 1825, uh, with the exception of uh, a couple of years during the Second World War. Uh, and the aim is to inspire kids about science through uh, active demonstration and getting involved with the uh, expert of the day. And so I wrote one, the book was specifically about um, the lectures devoted to space and to time. And I think uh, one of the points that the book makes is that the um, scientific thinking has, has moved on a great deal. Um, and you looked at a number of examples to, to demonstrate that fact. Could you go through a few, a few of those examples? Yeah, so the first lecture we covered in the book was 1881 which was given by Robert Ball. And I guess what struck me when I read about his lectures uh, and what he said was how different his solar system uh, was to the one that we would recognize today. So for example, he didn't know uh, what powered the sun. Uh, he explicitly says the moon is off limits, that the moon is too far away, it's too difficult for any human explorer to ever make it to the moon. Um, even things like the moons of Jupiter, he thought there were four. And today we know there are 69, at least. So our knowledge of our solar system has, uh, has come on quite a lot in the last century and a bit. Um, are there, have you reflected uh, the thinking of that book back into the present time and predicted uh, what scientific thinking, what scientific theories are likely to be disproved in the future? Yeah, so actually when I, when I give a talk about the book to um, scientific societies and school groups, the very last thing I talk about is taking the same time span of those lectures and projecting it forward. And if you do that, you get to, to the mid-22nd century. So I talk a bit about what space is going to be like then for us, potentially. Um, and we, we're kind of on the borderline of a couple of things. So um, increase access to space. So that space will not, will not be just a place that the lucky few, the highly trained, get to go. That we're all going to get to go uh, as part of leisure. You can pay to go to space. Um, the other things are we have some theories about um, dark matter, for example. This uh, mysterious stuff that appears to act as a glue to bind galaxies and, and groups of galaxies together. And we're kind of at a stage where we think we know what it is. But if we don't find it in the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to have to uh, return to the drawing board and, and think again. So I can imagine if a similar book was written in, in the 22nd century, what they might make of our, our ideas about dark matter and, and whether we finally get to, to understand what it, what it really is. What are your thoughts on the recent uh, blueprint for a super quantum computer? So this could be a real game changer. So uh, if you think about how much standard computers have uh, modernized our world and completely changed the way we do things, well, a quantum computer would be a, a completely different league. So the idea is that uh, the rules of quantum physics can get very weird. So for example, uh, we know that subatomic particles can be in two places at once, which for an object like us is crazy, right? You can't be in two places at once but a subatomic particle can. And so the way that a quantum computer works is that it would do uh, calculations simultaneously. Uh, and so it would get through calculations uh, a lot quicker than current computers. And so the sorts of things you can solve and the problems you can solve 
that might take a, a bank of computers a year to churn through all those numbers. You'd better do it in seconds with a quantum computer. Uh, Gerd Leonard has written a book called uh, Technology versus Humanity. And uh, the focus of the book is that we, as a human race, need to be extremely careful to have systems in place to manage this exponential growth in technology. What are your thoughts on that? It's something I've become really interested in recently with the idea of um, automation and AI and robotics and that kind of stuff. Um, it's tricky because the pace of change is so fast. And the traditional way of regulating things is so slow that it's very hard for regulation to, to keep up with things. Uh, and if one country says, okay, we're going we're gonna to stop and we're going to take this slow and we're going to make sure we do it carefully, there'll be somewhere else that doesn't do it like that. And therefore they'll plow on and they'll, uh, they'll make advances and, and be ahead of, of us. So it's very tricky. I think you have to strike a balance between uh, not letting people have a free-for-all and, and doing things which aren't carefully thought, thought through uh, but at the same time not put the brakes on too much so that you hamper your, your progress. So it's, it's difficult. You're a person who is interested in encouraging students to study both the arts and uh, sciences together uh, because there are so many jobs out there that require both sets of skills. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about that and where that mission is rooted? Yes, yeah, so when I was a kid, I was always a science mad uh, child and I was always kind of pushed in the sciences by my teachers because I'd, I kind of showed a natural aptitude for it. And I went on to study uh, astrophysics at, at university, but um, I didn't really realise that you could be a scientist or be involved in the sciences but also be creative as well. I guess there's two aspects to it. One, we're, we're kind of always taught as kids that, maybe indirectly, that science is a collection of facts, things to know, uh, things that we know, we've proved already. But it's not really. Science is a very uh, fluid body of knowledge. And it, you can be very creative as a scientist to come up with experiments and, and push our knowledge forwards. So science is creative anyway. But also now, I'm as a... Uh, science writer, you know, I'm combining writing and science together. And I didn't really realize that that was a career path until I was in my 20s. And so what I would really like to encourage is if you've got kids now who are, say, 13 or 14 and having to pick their subjects for, for GCSE and they're torn between, well, I love science, but I really like art and drama and writing. How am I ever going to pick between the two? to say actually, well, you can do both. I mean, maybe you have to choose, but you can always have the other thing very close by. So if you choose the science route, then remember that art and science can go together. You can write. Um, there are wonderful examples of artists being inspired by uh, science, and then vice versa. If you're uh, an artist, remember that there's a whole body of knowledge that you have access to which can inspire your art too. You're also um, very interested in encouraging collaboration across um, other fields of science, industry, arts, uh, and so on. Um, could you give us some examples where um, people from different areas um, have collaborated to produce something incredible? So this has become my big pet project for the last couple of years. When I talk to people about space, they some people say, why do we bother with it? Isn't it a bit of a waste of time and money? So I started digging around for examples of where space has been uh, useful in other areas. And I just became obsessed with it. So um, what really caught my attention was there was a study a couple of years ago where um, at the University of Cambridge, they had an open day where they got all their uh, scientists together for a tea, a cup of tea and a biscuit. Because they don't normally talk to each other. They're kind of busy doing their own thing in their own world. Uh, and one particular example is when the astronomers got talking with the oncologists, the cancer doctors, and uh, they realized they were doing really similar things. So um, astronomers use computer software to analyze pictures of space. But the doctors were counting uh, changes in tumors 
by eye down a microscope. So when the astronomers share with the oncologists their um, software, all of a sudden you can now analyze tumor samples uh, as accurately as a doctor, but more quickly. Uh, and it's hoped actually in future you can do it not just quicker, but more accurately, particularly for breast cancer. So to me, that was amazing. This, this software that had been dreamed up for pictures of galaxies was now happening to save lives. And so this has become a real project. And so now I now go into, uh, as a speaker, go to non-astronomical places. I've talked to the IT industry, the healthcare industry, uh, the HR industry, uh, big technology conferences, saying, A, collaboration and conversation is key. Talk to people you don't normally talk to. You don't want to be doing the same thing twice. It's, it's a waste of everyone's time. Um, but the other thing is that space is so unusual, it kind of jolts you into a completely new way of thinking and other sectors can really learn from that and so I guess they're my two key messages, collaboration and, and big thinking. And so it's no surprise that um, you came into contact uh, with IdeaMe who are also trying to encourage cross collaboration of ideas. Um, amongst creators, amongst future creators and also the general public from arts right the way through to space and sciences and so, so on. Um, you are joining us as an Idea Me STEAM mentor. Could you give us some thoughts on uh, your plans for carrying out this work? So yeah, what I would really like to, to, to get in contact with is, is someone a bit like I was saying, who is on that verge, not necessarily just 13, 14, maybe someone who is um, an undergraduate too, and uh, perhaps a, a, is in the middle of a science degree, but has that crisis that a lot of um, undergraduates have, including me when I was at university. You get about 18 months into your degree and, and you, you've loved science since you were a kid, but you've got a view of what being a research scientist is like, and you don't like it. It's not the life for you. So you want to be involved in science somehow, but you don't want to be a research scientist. What do you do? Uh, and one, one route is to be a science communicator, presenter, writer. I also have, uh, over the years, come into contact with uh, a number of artists who are producing amazing things based on science. Uh, whether that be exhibitions, artwork, um, even soundscapes. So I'd be able to put uh, any mentees in contact with some pretty interesting people who could uh, kind of further their ideas about the, the link between science and art. Could you talk to us about the book that you're working on with an artist? This is really exciting for me because it's, it's very different to, to what I've been doing uh, book-wise before. So it's about uh, physics, it's going to be called The Speed of Starlight, that's the, the working title. And it's with a surrealist artist. Uh, and I love the, the, the work they've been doing. And so it's, um, I have to write very short uh, pieces about different parts of uh, physics and astronomy, whether that be black holes or um, the, literally the speed of starlight or how old stars are or, or the oldest light in the universe, those kind of things. But I've got to come up with very visual ways of, of describing it so the artist has something to work with. So just yesterday I was writing a paragraph about telescopes and describing them as light buckets. <laughs> uh, in a sense that if you, want to, uh, if you imagine that the starlight falling to the earth is rain, if you want to collect a lot of rain, you need a big bucket. <laughs> and so we have tiny buckets in our faces, just little ones, so we can barely collect any starlight. If we want to see very faint things, very far away, we need a bigger bucket, we need a telescope. And so that's the, that's the challenge, is to come up with visual ways that then they can run with their surreal uh, uh, illustrations. Um, it seems to me you are a very unusual type of person. You can speak to anybody. You have a sense of wonder about creativity, science, space, and you're able to distill that down and communicate that. You meet school children, you meet students, uh, university, um, you meet fellow scientists. Out of everybody that you have met, or not yet met, who would you like to meet? And what question would you like to ask that person? 
So it might be quite obvious answer given what I do, but I think it has to be Elon Musk, just because he's he's the one that's really thinking big in the space sector now. The things that he's doing, the Falcon 9 rockets, for example, is amazing. But also he gets he gets communication as well. The way that he's uh, sharing those events with the general public. So what I'd ask him is, because his ultimate goal is to get people uh, to Mars, which is something a lot of kids ask me about. So my question to him would be, what can we do uh, to get this message out to as many people as possible and kind of win the hearts and minds of people? Because quite a lot of the time people do say, oh, what? come on, we've got bigger problems, haven't we? Why, why shouldn't, should we be sending people to Mars? Uh, and so uh, I have an answer for that, but uh, I'd like to ask him uh, what he thinks we need to do to, to convince more people to get on board with this idea. Where did this sense of wonder come from? Was there somebody in your childhood that instilled it? Or did you set about a voyage of discovery on your own? What sparked it? I think I've always, it's always been there. I've always had that just natural curiosity. Uh, I remember looking up at the night sky as a kid and being captivated. And for me, there were two, two things about it, I guess. One, it was escapism, because you could imagine kind of being somewhere else and somewhere um, quite beautiful. But also kind of, and I'm not sure I realized this at the time, but I, I think I have you know, retrospectively, is that as kids, we're told many stories, um, fantasy stories, fairy tales, you know, wonderful stories about wizards and witches and goblins and dragons. And, but I always kind of had a sense that they weren't real. I knew they were fiction, but then there were other stories about Jupiter and Saturn and stars and galaxies and some of the stories rival the fiction stories. You know, there are stars out there that explode with unimaginable force, planets where it rains diamonds, planets that have two sunsets and two uh, sunrises, so you'd have two shadows. And so to me there was this, one was real and one wasn't. Uh, in terms of people, I think my dad always encouraged me. Um, he has no science background at all, but he kind of fostered that curiosity. Um, and also Helen Sharman, the first British astronaut. My dad took me to a, a public talk she gave on my birthday. I think it was my seventh birthday. Um, and I remember it was the first time I realized space could be a job. So before that, I'd loved space, but he was someone who was doing it as a career. And, and I guess that always stuck with me. And, and now I'm very lucky that, okay, I haven't been into space, but space is my job. Could you talk to us a little bit about um, some of the unknown facts, all their facts that maybe the general public have forgotten? For example, you talk of um, the red tap and the blue tap and you compare that to the colour of stars and you know the colour of a hot star versus a, um, a medium heat star versus a cooling star. Can you talk to us about that? And also, could you talk to us about time travel? So, yeah, with the, the TAPS thing, that's a great example of, uh, of preconceptions, actually, that we grow up with certain ideas because they're so familiar to us and so entrenched, we never question them. So we grow up with this idea that red is hot and blue is cold. Because every day we do our teeth, we wash our hands, and there it is, red is, red is warm and blue is cold. But that's not true. Uh, even looking at normal flames on the earth, you can see that. So a blowtorch flame, really hot and blue. A normal flame is yellow. And then only when a fire starts to die out and cool down does it glow red. And it's the same with stars. So, I mean, stars aren't on fire, but it's a, it's a similar principle. So when you see stars in the night sky, the blue ones are the hottest, and then yellow ones like the sun are somewhere in between. Uh, and then the red ones are the coolest. So this is kind of part of the, why I go in and talk to uh, kind of companies about this kind of stuff, because it's disruptive. It's saying, what are the things that you are equally not even questioning because yes. they've become yeah. so entrenched? entrenched. Yeah. I mean, it's, for example, look at a map of the world. We grew up with a map of the world and it has the UK in the middle. Um, but I was in uh, Japan recently and saw a map of the world of Japan and it has Japan in the middle. <laughs> And suddenly you see all the countries in different places and you realise how big the Pacific Ocean is and yes. so there's those kind of things. 
Um, in terms of time travel, this is also something that I, l I love to talk about because it blows people's minds. In the sense that our ideas about time, are not our scientific ideas, but our everyday ideas are, are really wrong. So we always think that time uh, ticks at the same rate, always. You can't travel through time, um, but that's not the case. So we already have people that have traveled through time. Now that may sound like a really quackish thing to say, but I'll back it up with genuine, genuine science. We know from Einstein's work that if you travel through space uh, faster than someone else, you will get through time faster than them too. The theory of relativity. Yeah, and it shouldn't be so surprising. So if I said to you that if you ran a 100 meter race with Usain Bolt, that he got to the finish line before you, you wouldn't be surprised, right? No. <laughs> but if I said that he also uh, got through time faster than you because he was running faster than you, you'd think I was crazy. Mm. But what Einstein did was realize that space and time are, are, are completely connected. So not only if you travel fast through space, do you get through space quicker, you also get through time quicker too, relative to the slower moving person. So our astronauts on the space station, as they're orbiting around the Earth, they're doing so quicker than we are. So they are time traveling into the future. And there's a Russian astronaut uh, who has uh, traveled through time more than anybody else. Yeah, it's Gennady Poldalka. He holds the record for the most number of days in orbit, uh, more than 800 days on separate missions. But it means that he's a 50th of a second younger. <laughs> so he's time traveled a 50th of a second into the future. Now that sounds, you know, who cares about that? But the only reason it's so small is because he's not going very fast. If he went faster through space, that time would be greatly increased. So you could imagine that in a hundred years that the difference might be a week, maybe a month. It's still not that interesting. But you can imagine in thousands of years, if you start traveling, if we start traveling through space uh, at a significant fraction of the speed of light, things are going to get really weird. So you can imagine getting on a spaceship, going on a big loop, you think 10 years has passed because time's running differently for you. You come back home though, and it's suddenly the year 9,000. <laughs> You're only 10 years older, but the Earth is now 7,000 years old. Yes, yeah. Because time is running more slowly for you. So what happens then? Do, you, do they even remember who you are when you come back 7,000 years from now? Imagine dumping someone from, uh, thousand years ago, or no, seven thousand years ago, into the world of today, would they even be able to survive? Would you have to have customs and passports? If you put a pound in a bank account before you left and you returned home, would you get seven thousand years interest on your pound? Like this, the things we take for granted yes. um, will change. And so that's the, one of the lovely things about the, the physics of time, is that it shows you um, that our preconceptions are uh, shaky. And what really nailed it for me was, if you look at the graph of this effect, how much time slows, uh, depending on your speed, that graph looks exactly the same as the graph of technological progress. If you graph the uh, speed of computers mm -hmm. for the last 100 years, the shape of the graph is identical. So. One of my key messages when I go out and speak to um, businesses and things is we don't notice that our ideas about time are wrong because we live on the bottom part of the graph. But as technology improves and we get faster rockets, we're going to move on to this part of the graph yes. and all the rules are going to change. So equally, in our uh, businesses, we're currently on this part of the graph, mm -hmm. but as computers and internet of things and uh, big data, wearables, uh, robotics, all those things follow that upwards trajectory. You're going to find that there are many other things you think are uh, a given and you're going to be left a bit uh, in the dark if you're not careful. So the, one of the things about time is challenge up your preconceptions now before it's too late, otherwise you're, you, you might be left with an egg on your face. You're working on another book um, you're joining us as the STEAM mentor, um, you 
are constantly uh, presenting lectures, um, giving speeches and talking to students. Um, out of all the enormous advances that are being worked on in the world, scientific, uh, technological, is there a particular project that you would give your eye teeth to work on? So maybe not to work on because I, I wouldn't uh, yes. have the, the skills to, as a scientist to work on them, but uh, to kind of get up close and uh, talk to the, the scientists and see how, how things are being built. Um, it's just a tricky one. So they're currently building a really uh, massive telescope called, uh, this is the sense of humor of astronomers, it's called the European Extremely Large Telescope. <laughs> and uh, because it's already a very large telescope. Uh, and I was lucky enough to go to Chile last year and have a little tour of the very large telescope. But they pointed out in the distance the peak and they flattened the with dynamite the top of this mountain in the desert to build the, the EELT uh, and that's going to have a, a 39 meter mirror on it. My goodness. Which is one of the biggest telescopes you've ever built. Um, and so that's going to be an amazing new window on, uh, on the world. The other really interesting thing right now is, is gravitational waves which we've only discovered in the last couple of years. So it's been, uh, they've been predicted for 100 years by Einstein. The idea is that uh, if two things collide in space, they send ripples out, very much like a, dropping a stone on a pond. But these ripples are so small that we've only just been able to find them. And it is a, uh, a completely new way of seeing the universe. Imagine if you're in a room and the room is completely dark and you have no source of light and you're trapped in that room. You've really got to work hard to work out mm -hmm. what your environment is like and there are some things you're never going to get to learn about if there's no light and then imagine someone gives you a torch and all of a sudden your eyes are completely open to all this stuff around you well gravitational waves are like that because there are some things in the universe that only emit or can only be seen in gravitational waves not in um, invisible light so that will be useful in identifying dark matter it could be. Um, the, the two main things, I guess, for it are, for a long time, physicists have, have been looking for this uh, massive theory. Mm -hmm. So we have these two theories, and they're brilliant. Quantum physics, which explains the tiny stuff, and then Einstein's mm -hmm. relativity that explains the really big stuff. What we've not been able to do yet is combine those two together to give us some theory of everything. You know, one theory that will explain the way to do that is to try and see uh, when relativity breaks down, when it's no longer an accurate description of what's going on. So if you've got two black holes colliding, for example, Einstein makes very strong predictions about what those waves should look like. If you see something that's not uh, matching what he says, then there's your, maybe your way into this theory. Uh, for me, the really exciting thing is, and this is what I get asked by kids all the time, are there other universes? Is ours the only one or are there lots? And if there are lots, things also get very weird. So um, if you have an infinite number of other universes, there are only a finite number of ways of arranging things in those universes. So let's imagine you roll uh, six dice and you do that a million times. In those million rolls, you're gonna get the same numbers crop up, right? One, two, three, four, five, six every now and again. It's the same with the, if there's lots of universes. If you roll the dice of atoms, you end up with the same configuration occasionally. Oh. Down to the atom. So that means that if that, this idea is true, there's another universe out there where all the atoms in this room are arranged identically. Oh my goodness. Down to the atoms in you and me. <laughs> down to the atoms in my voice box, vibrating the air and traveling across and entering your ears and going That's to your That's terrifying. Brain, which is kind of terrifying. Now what, how, how that links to gravitational waves uh, is that if, there's some predictions that if you don't get one big bang and you get lots, each creating a universe, uh, you should have got some gravitational waves passing through the early universe. And if we pick those up, it's a way of testing the, the theory, uh, which is called inflation. 
the idea that, that you get lots of universes inflating. Uh, and there's this very scary multiverse out there. So I, I love talking about the multiverse stuff because kids' minds go, <laughs> uh, and we're kind of on we're kind of on the point now where we can test these ideas in a in a in a meaningful way, whereas in the past it was just well, science fiction. Are there any uses of technology in the world that that you're frightened of in terms of the exponential growth and things progress not being monitored enough? Um, is there anything about you? You're very excited about progress, but is there any aspect of it that frightens you? I think it's that tra that transition that's going to come between uh, in the world of work, really. So if you increase technology and you increase automation, you're going to um, you know, strip out quite a lot of the jobs. You know, for example, if you have um, self-checkouts at, at supermarkets, then you're taking away those lower paid jobs that might be a stepping stone up the kind of social mobility ladder. Uh, and so if you need a kind of way of uh, handling that, and so I've become quite interested in the idea of, and I'm not sure whether, whether I agree with it yet or not, but I'm reading a lot about it, the idea of, of a universal basic income as a kind of social dividend, that we're going to get to the point where uh, you know, everyone gets paid a set amount of money per year, a reasonably small amount, that will cover your basic um, needs. And then you can choose whether you want to work on top of that or not. Uh, because otherwise you're going to end up with a kind of two-tier society where you have the, the workers and the non-workers and maybe the, 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 um, the gap between the haves and have-nots grows. So we do something about that, whether universal basic income is the answer or not, I'm still trying to figure that one out. Um, I guess the other unspoken elephant in the room is climate change. Because we're, all, we're kind of setting this, uh, these ideas about the future uh, and projecting them forward from now. You know, what's the world of now going to be like with this new technology? But we haven't kind of factored in that the world's going to change if we're not careful um, because of global warming. And if you've got particular parts of the world where uh, they're under huge environmental pressure because the temperature's gone up, the water levels have gone up, you're going to get even more probably economic migrants than you have today because everyone's going to want to be somewhere where it's palatable to live uh, and how that fits in with technology and progress too is, um, is something we have we have to figure out but it's, it's messy I don't think that there's any because it's so big and we now live in this big global society I don't think there's any one organization or, or government that can sort of solve it all we have to just kind of keep this in our minds and plow on anyway and see where we see where we go. I mean, the other end of the spectrum, which is something that, that um, people like Stephen Hawking have said, is that it's kind of inevitable that we're going to rub ourselves out eventually. You know, what, why, why do we not have any evidence of any other civilizations in the galaxy when there are stars like the sun and planets like the earth? And maybe it's because a technological race is a fairly short-lived thing. Eventually you, uh, you do yourselves out of but I, ho I hope that's not the case. But I guess that's <laughs> the <do. laughs> that's the less the less cheery side of things. So to end on a positive note, could we have some words of inspiration for anyone, young, old, or in between, who's thinking of setting out on a journey of exploration, whether it is to create a big idea or to learn something new, what would you recommend? Dream big, I think, is the first place to start because uh, don't be restricted by what everyone else is doing. Don't, you don't have to take the, the well-trodden path. Um, so, for example, I've never had a job. I've, I've kind of set out on my own and picked different things together and it's been an immense fun. So, uh, and people tell me to start with, you know, what were you? You won't get the money, it'll be too insecure, you won't, uh, it's a really difficult life. You sure you want to be doing that? And uh, yes, I definitely do, and it, and it works. So don't, don't let anyone else tell you you can't do it. Dream big. But also spread your net really wide. 
because studies have shown that the most successful people, they don't necessarily have the biggest network of contacts and, and people they know. Um, it's more that they are the bridge between lots of different groups of people. Because then they can be bring ideas in from one group and send them off to another. Uh, so that's, that's the kind of marker of successful people. So surround yourself with interesting people. And that, that's everyone. Not just the kind of echo chamber of your immediate peers. Go, go to museums, go to art galleries, talk to artists, um, talk to scientists, talk to musicians, talk to sports people about determination and, and uh, you know, grit. So yeah, cast your net really wide. The world's such an interesting place. Don't uh, kind of limit yourself to a small pool. Colin Stewart, astronomer, writer, author, keynote speaker, teacher, motivator, and now idea me mentor. Thank you so much for your time. We're excited about what you're doing, and I think everybody else will be as well. Thank you for having me.